Thank you, Madam Speaker. This House, this House of Commons, has been called upon many times to pronounce its judgment, to vote, to vote on legislation, to vote on amendments, to vote on estimates, to vote on motions. In the parlance of parliamentary procedure, when the House of Commons votes, it divides. When a recorded vote is requested and we are asked to stand and be counted, it is called a recorded division. There are times in this House when votes are decided on division without a roll call. At Westminster, recorded divisions are conducted through division lobbies. This House dividing is not new. The House has been dividing on subjects great and small since the first session of the first Parliament on November 6, 1867. We have been dividing for nearly 155 years. This is what we do. This is what we are sent here to do, to serve on behalf of our constituents and on behalf of the people of Canada. We make decisions on behalf of the people we serve. We vote yay or we vote nay. There is no grey zone in between. There are no asterisks appended to our votes. There are few explanations as to why or how or for what reasons we came to decisions on any particular matter. At 7.30 p.m. this evening, the division bells will ring and the House of Commons will be called upon at 8 o'clock p.m to divide on the matter of whether to confirm the government's declaration of a public order emergency pursuant to the Emergencies Act. Forever in Hansard and in the journals, our names will be listed as having divided one way or the other on this very, very motion before us today. Divisions in this House are normal. Divisions in opinions and thoughts and ideas are normal. Different views represented in this place and elsewhere are normal and are signs of a healthy democracy. But what is not healthy are the divisions in our, countries, er, in our country and the divisions in our communities. In recent weeks and months, I have never seen such division in our country, such anger, such frustration. We are one country, but we are a country that has sadly grown more divided. Now, each of us can play a role in reducing this division, but it requires work. It requires us to refrain from throwing more fuel on the proverbial fire and listening to one another rather than talking past each other. Now, let me be clear. I will be voting against the use of the Emergencies Act. But my vote is far more than a simple nay. It is more than a monosyllabic answer and it requires more than a 140-character tweet of an explanation. It is possible to add some grey to a black and white explanation. Madam Speaker, in Canada, it is possible to disagree with, to condemn, and to call for the removal of illegal blockades, while also suggesting that the government use measures short of the Emergencies Act to achieve that. As Canadians, we can call for and reinforce the need to be a country of law and order while also arguing that the tools of the Emergencies Act are an overreach. We can and we must call out and condemn those who would use anti-democratic and nonsensical MOUs and call, which call for the overthrow of a democratic government, while at the same time listening to the concerns of individual Canadians, business owners, truck drivers and entrepreneurs who are concerned about how rules have impacted their businesses, their livelihoods, and their families. Madam Speaker, we can and we must call for the peaceful resolution of situations while at the same time disagreeing with efforts to debank or freeze the assets of Canadian citizens. The question that confronts us today is whether this Act and the provisions included in the Order and Council are appropriate at this time and in these circumstances. On October 16, 1970, 
the House of Commons convened to debate the Declaration of the War Measures Act by Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Of the speeches given that day, none was as clear as the clarion call of the gentleman from Prince Albert, the Right Honourable John Diefenbaker. In this House, at that time, he said, Mr. Speaker, this is one of those occasions when Parliament has the opportunity of dealing with the question of freedom, which, above everything else, is the mandate of Parliament and the reason that Parliament exists. Today, 52 years later, Parliament is called upon once again to deal with this question of freedom. When the government places limits on the rights, freedoms and privileges of Canadians, it is the government and the government alone that must justify it. It is the government that must show to Canadians that the limitations are reasonable. Indeed, the Emergencies Act itself requires it. The Honourable Perrin Beatty served as Minister of National Defence in 1987 when he introduced Bill C-77, an act to authorize the taking of special temporary measures to ensure safety and security during national emergencies and to amend other acts in consequence thereof, the short title being the Emergencies Act. Mr. Beatty, I might add, was actually the Member of Parliament for parts of Wellington County, which are now within my riding of Perth Wellington. In an interview last week with the Wellington Advertiser, Mr. Beatty said that when he was asked about the act being used appropriately, he replied, without being privy to government intelligence, he said flatly, I don't have enough information. All of us are inclined to give the government the benefit of the doubt, he added, saying the onus falls on the government to prove its case. BD did, however, point out blockades afflicting Canada's trade routes were resolved without reliance on the Act, which was intended to be used when everything else had failed. And, Madam Speaker, that's a good point to emphasize. The blockades at the Ambassador Bridge and the Coutts border crossing were all resolved with police enforcement rather than relying on the Emergencies Act. Now, Madam Speaker, I know there have been arguments that enforcement have used different measures that we have granted to them through the Emergencies Act. But that's not the question that faces us. The question that faces us is whether other measures were available short of the Emergencies Act. In an interview on Sunday with CTV's question period, no less an authority than the, the former Commissioner of the Ontario Pro Provincial Police confirmed that he saw no need for the Emergencies Act to undertake the actions that were taken in downtown Ottawa. He said this, it was a lack of bodies, a lack of officers to do what we saw done today, or saw done yesterday. This could have happened on day two or three if they could have amassed the number of officers they had. In fact, Madam Speaker, Section 21 of the Comprehensive Ontario Police Services Act already provides for the provision of emergency police services from any province or from the federal government. So when the government says the Emergencies Act wasn't the first or the second step, the question hangs in the air of why this act wasn't used before the sledgehammer of the Emergencies Act. Others have suggested that this act was needed for tow trucks, to compel tow trucks to assist in removing of trucks in downtown Ottawa. But again, there are other provisions that could have achieved this. Section 129B of the Criminal Code gives police the option to require anyone with reasonable excuse to assist a public officer or peace officer in the execution of his duty in arresting a person or preserving the peace. Frankly, Madam Speaker, it would appear that the only tools employed by the government that were not previously affordable to them was the financial powers. And these are the powers that have concerned so many people. Being debanked, even for a period of 30 days, could have serious impacts on an individual, not just for 30 days, but for 30 years to come. And the government actually considering making some of these tools permanent is even more concerning for all Canadians. When temporary powers become permanent powers, the concern for all Canadians is great. Madam Speaker, I conclude my comments with the words of former Prime Minister John Diefenbaker. Parliament is more than procedure, it is the custodian of the nation's freedom. Madam Speaker, may we all live up to that duty today. Thank you.